Hey, what's up? So I'm going to try and install OpenBSD in a virtual machine, which happens to be VirtualBox on an operating system. The host operating system happens to be uh, Windows 8.1. And, uh, hmm. So yeah, I tried NetBSD, and it was an absolutely fantastically horrible experience. I didn't even try NetBSD, really. I tried installing it, and I did get it to boot and install, but I was over it. So anyway, I was told by some very knowledgeable people that uh, OpenBSD might be the way to go. So that's what I'm trying. So right here, I'm on the openbsd.org slash fac slash fac4.html download. Um, I basically just went to openbsd.org and clicked the download in the sidebar. So it looks like I have at least four choices here. I've got an image that seems to be a more complete image that can be written to a USB flash drive or similar device, including includes the file sets. This one's the same thing without the file sets. This one's an ISO image with the file sets, ISO image without the file sets, and whatnot. And then down here we have a floppy image in case any of these aren't bootable. You can probably use that just to get in. Checking signatures. Flashing drives with DD, burning to real CD-ROM drives, which is kind of funny, because I have to imagine that most of those ISO images aren't actually used on real disks anymore, even though I still have lots of these around. I, I go to thrift stores and buy them. They are usually like five bucks, if even that, and they uh, maybe have a few disks missing, but they're there. They're still pretty, I think they're still the cheapest readily available consumer backup thing. Besides, of course, tape, which I don't really consider a consumer backup. And uh, I don't know, maybe if you find a flash disc on sale compared to a new stack of CDs. Anyway, moving right along, there's the file sets, I guess. I'm not super familiar with BSD. I could count the times I've ever installed it on one and now maybe two hands. But... I don't know, unless I'm like really into something, there's a lot of people are probably maybe similar, unless I'm like super into it, I'm not going to sit there and read all the directions, I'll just skim through them. But then if I if I start to do it, and I'm like, hey, I feel like I'm into this, then I'll go back and I'll read the directions like crazy, 20 times. So that's where I'm at with things, so here we go. Prepare for the whole place to burn down. I'm just going to grab, how big is this one? AMD 64, sure. Install image in Applesoft basic folder. Okay. 664 megs, so technically that would fit on a CD-ROM. Huh, maybe I should just do the CD-ROM because sometimes though it depends on the way that dot image files, that could be anything. You know, it's just like, hey, this is some form of a disk layout. It's like, are there multiple partitions? What's going on here? So you don't truly know what you're always getting with an image file. Sometimes they work really well. Sometimes I'm just like, you know what? Back to the ISO. All right, it's downloaded. And I'd like to take a moment to tell you this video is not sponsored by ThriftBooks. ThriftBooks is the largest independent bookstore that hasn't been swallowed up by gross giants like Amazon. So go here and buy all your books and I get nothing because like I said, they're not even paying me to tell you that. But I just want to let you know. Um, if you do want to have some effect on me, then go there and buy this book, The Design and Implementation of the 4.4 BSD Operating System. It's only $12.50. Your money does not go to supporting robots, but it goes towards supporting independent people indie companies everything you claim to be about right this is the last copy of it so um it's not about the shell and general operating system this is more about the kernel itself so it equally applies to like supposedly to like mac os x and stuff like that so anyway for that kind of a geek go buy this last copy otherwise i'm going to and it's probably going to sit in a stack like these books right here and I'll probably just read it occasionally when I poop. So I imagine you might do something better with it. Anyway, back to this regularly scheduled program. And of course, OpenBSD does make the claim 
to be uh, how do we get okay there it is 4.4 BSD based Unix so anyway that's the ballpark we want to be in right so now that I have that image file in my conveniently appropriately located applesoft folder i'm going to go into my virtual machine manager create a new virtual machine name it open bsd 64 bit one gig of ram create virtual disk okay i want to kick that down a little bit create okay there we are i'm going to click that make sure settings and what do we have here Okay, there's the empty hard drive, empty CD-ROM drive. We'll go ahead and just uh, choose a disk file. And then this is going to be in my, my downloads develop folder. This is where I have like the internet freaking archived, basically. Okay, what am I, I forgot what I'm doing. So I need to go, since I'd saved it in the exact appropriate space that was in basic because they must have a basic interpreter on that image somewhere right and applesoft and the reason this folder was selected is because i had recently downloaded that um hmm it won't let me open it because it's not a cd image it all makes sense so what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy that for future posterity and I'm going to need to add a disk, a regular disk drive in this case. If you just did the ISO, you're set. That's why I should have really done that. But what I want to do is I'm going to try adding. Will it let me? Oh, no, that's not the type of hard disk. So what I probably have to do, there is a command line program, I believe, that will convert a dot I, most dot IMG files to a VMDK virtual disk file. I just, I don't feel like going that route right now, so normally I probably would, especially if it was like one of my favorite distributions of Linux maybe, but honestly, I tend to run into more trouble with the uh, those IMG images than I do the ISOs. The ISOs have just been, they've been in the game for like an extra decade, I feel like, so people kind of have those figured out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this one right here that should be roughly the exact equivalent, and I'm going to also save that to the AppleSoft folder. And I'm also going to pause it so that it's a little smaller. Hmm. I'm also going to pause it so that, uh, yeah, it goes by quick on your end. All right, it's done downloading. Come back over here, go to that CD. CD. Sorry, didn't do my voice exercises before I started recording. Toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. And that was weird. Okay, where to go? It's in the folder. It should be looking for it in. That's not right. Um, I need to go back and finish my QBasic stuff. I got to the point, I was doing a little QBasic series, uh, basically like translating the C tutorial from the K&RC manual to QBasic. And I got to floating points, and I'll tell you what, I did not realize the uh, how big of a gaping rabbit hole that was. And I'm going for AppleSoft, not sidetrack stories. Install 70, very, very discreet. I like discreet. Okay. Audio, I'll just leave it. Okay. Double clicky. And I didn't click live disk or whatever. And some people, maybe if they're weird like me, might think like, oh, why didn't you click live DVD CD? That's what it is, isn't it? Um, it is, but all that checkbox really does is uh, just prevents the drive from the virtual drive from effectively ejecting. So if you want to disable that so-called functionality and force that live CD to always be in there, then go ahead and check it. But especially for an install, even if you're installing from a quote unquote live CD, 
they should just say stop drive from ejecting like parentheses i.e live cd or something to make it more self-explanatory sorry i think i'm getting sidetracked with my stories okay but does it say welcome to uh the open bsd amd 64 7.0 installation program Install, upgrade, auto install, or shell. Never a big fan of like auto installs. I like the customs. Usually not too custom on my first round, but at least a few choices, a few details. At any prompt except password prompts, you can escape to a shell by typing an exclamation point. Default answers are shown in square brackets and are selected by pressing return. You can exit this program at any time by pressing control C, but this can leave your system in an inconsistent state. I actually love this. If you did happen to be one of the people who caught my NetBSD thing, um, I apologize in advance that that whole thing, but even though this one still has kind of like an uglyish look to it, right? This is what I expect. I feel like it gives me as a slightly techie person enough info to like really go forward. They front loaded it with like the, the emergency stuff I want to know, like control C, how do I get out? How do I get back? Overall, you know, everything could always be better, right? But I'm digging this so far. I feel like it's not out of my league or some weird engineering stuff. Like it's geared somewhat towards a normal human being as far as the type of human being that might be installing this, which is kind of an oxymoron, right? Who's normal using BSD? Not me. Choose your keyboard layout. I'm just going to go with default because we know that's the uh, the new world keyboard order, which is probably United States. Who knows? Uh, system, host name, short, example, foo. I like foo. Um, Debian always just names it Debian, and I leave it that. I'll name this one foo. I imagine bar is already taken. Available network interfaces are EM0VL, V, excuse me, VLAN0. Yeah. Everybody who recommended op OpenBSD, I'm already digging it. I love this because, of course, in the different Unixes, they use these little, I mean, in hindsight, once you know them, you know them, right? But if you don't, it's like, how am I ever supposed to guess EM0 and what that might mean? So up front, they're just like, hey, this is what this means when you see this little thing. I love it. Which network interface do you wish to configure? And I'm just going with the inners here, enter, and we'll see how it works. And what's cool, too, is I feel comfortable so far with the inters. When I got halfway through with the NetBSD, inter was, like, not even in the scope anymore. It was, like, weird. It was so weird to just... It was all about being tangled. So, uh, IP6 address. Yeah, I'll pass on that. Available network interfaces are that. Which network do you want to continue? Pfft, boom, they know I'm done. Wow, I can just hit enter. I don't have to, like, go through a cryptic list. Some weird order. Using DNS domain, my domain, that name server. Okay, I, I trust them at this point. Um, the thing is, though, my one little tiny qualm, which, like I said, nothing's perfect, is that I almost wanted to hit password rate or hit enter because it looked like a prompt, but they're asking me for my password. So I'm just going to hit enter just for kicks to see what they do. Again, the password must be set. Okay, cool. And if I would have typed something, it probably would have said it didn't match. So. That works. All right, my password is P A S S E R. Word or I'm trying to type a different password and lie about what I'm typing. Uh, but I was trying to spell password. Start SSHD by default. Cool. They just ask you. No. If you started it, it wouldn't hurt, right? Maybe I will just leave it at the default. It's going to use a few more system resources to have a a service running a SSH session, but big deal. Do you expect to run the X window system? Yeah, I like how they want that by default. That's brave, especially with BSD. I know it's maybe most of them aren't quite as progressed as Linux maybe in that area. I don't know. I'm stuck in the 90s. Do you want to have X window system to be started by that? By default, no, huh? So it, Xeno Display Manager is what I'm getting out of that. Probably uh, anybody who has any light experience with X should be able to determine that that is a... Uh, very likely, you know, your login prompt effectively. And if you weren't, whatever, you know, you could figure it out. Everything's very linear. I like the way this is playing out. The NetBSD one, it took up the full screen and everything, but 
even though technically that's supposed to be fancier and user friendly, this one's going to be more friendly across terminals as well as to users. So I'm totally digging this on the geek level. Uh, we're not going to start that display manager. So either it'll probably just have us log in at the command prompt, which is fine. That's how I used to do Windows back in the day. Even when Windows 95 came out, I'd disable the GUI, get to that DOS prompt, live my life, and then if I wanted to fire up Windows for some specific reason, I would do that. And then, of course, everybody migrated there, and I didn't have much choice. So that's when I got into Linux. Set up a user, enter a lowercase login name. Ah, oh, we'll stick with root for now. Roots targeted by password guessing attacks. Pub keys are... Okay, that's my problem. I don't have this sized properly. I'll stretch it out here. Um, pub keys are safer. Allow SSH login. No. What time zone are you in? Wow, it knew my time zone. Remember what a pain in that? That was a pain in the ass on that BSD. Which disk is the root disk? Taking their word, seems to be sensible. No valid MBR GPT. Use whole disk. So they did try to detect if there was another format instead of just asking me these esoteric terms. Uh, more points. Use whole disk MBR, whole disk GPT, or edit, or what? I'm going to go with whole disk MBR and see what they give me. You know, that's their default. I love that. Which, of course, if you're trying to d install this on bare metal on a modern machine, you'd probably need to change that to GPT. Uh, setting open BSD. As a matter of fact, I want to say like 99% of 60, especially modern 64-bit operating systems, are they seem to be marrying more and more to that GPT. Maybe that's just Windows world. Setting up OpenBSD MBR partition, the auto allocate layout for WD0 is this stuff, which of course they're doing a swap, all that. That's typical. That That's the way that they've been doing that for decades, even though, like I said, it grosses me out, especially on a virtual machine. Um, Debian, I want to say, and there were some other distros before them, are not doing that anymore. They're saying, hey, they offer this type of thing, but then they also say, hey, do you want to just do the simple scheme of just the one root partition so whatever i'm sure there's probably reasons i'm sure people have probably been back and forth about it on open bsd or whatever but um i don't know at least with this project i feel like there's hope i feel like i could go in and be like make some case or something like that for if i wanted anything changed or feature added or i could maybe submit a change this project i would consider doing that okay so I'm just going to go ahead and leave it on this automatic layout, I guess. What are the sizes? Oh, no, I'm not. I just, that's a lot. You know, that's like three gigs to user, one gig to root. It's just like no matter which way we slice it, I feel like there's going to be a lot of wasted space, even though the drive dynamically grows. So it's not like going to be wasted until it's actually utilized. But um, then part of it's utilized here, part of it's utilized there, so they're not sharing that same allocation. So if you kind of get what I'm saying, it's going to grow with this dynamic hard drive, like home, like let's say I download a, for some reason I download like a DVD image in home. So I'm going to have this ISO file that's going to grow to like four gigabytes or whatever. And so that therefore is going to expand that partition if it theoretically fit there, which it won't. So I'll say two gigabyte, right? And uh but then it's not going to auto contract. But at the same time, nothing else is going to utilize that space. So if I install something to user, it's just going to regrow it out, you know, more gigs or whatever. And so I'm going to end up with all this ballooning. But the thing is, if they all share a single partition, then when I download that DVD image and I decide like, okay, I'm done with it and I delete it. And then like the next day I go in and install like a whole development environment or whatever that development environment would then reutilize that space that was allocated for the DVD download, if that makes sense. So that's part, that's where I'm coming from is more of like a home user that sometimes has it all the time has a tendency to fill up my hard drive, no matter how big it is. And uh, it also on a virtual machine as well, because for virtual machines, like that's where the swap file really kicks in with me is I don't want to have a dedicated swap file on it. I'd rather allocate, especially if it's in the cloud, like a real virtual machine. Um, I don't want it ever <laughs> to hit the swap file. You know what I mean? I'd almost just rather it crashed than to do that. And in the cloud, they're like, seem to be just so horribly inefficient if they do swap, like even worse than a personal PC or something, the effect of it. But yeah, you really, it's just, it's not an option really. Anyway.
moving along. Oh, I accidentally hit auto, so I'm stuck with that stupid scheme. That's probably good. Location of sets. CD, it's defaulting to CD0. I don't have, NetBSD gave me a, a list of like a dozen things, and I was just sitting there like, what do I pick? This one's wonderful for people like me that would prefer not to have to read the manual the first time through. I mean, I literally think I could have just hit enter except for that root password. Path name to the sets. That reminds me of old school Debian. It was kind of had that vibe to it. Uh, select sets by entering the name, file name, pattern, all, da, 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 da. So those are all checked. This is something, and this is like a kernel of truth, so to speak. Like, I feel like I could go to the manual and just look up these sets and come to a really quick answer about what these are if I wanted to. Whereas with the NetBSD, I just felt like I've got to read the whole manual probably two or three times before I come back to this. I didn't, which neither manual I've looked at, just the, the vibe I get from looking at it. You know what I mean? Like, if it's something where it's like an occasional thing like this, that works. It's good enough. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and leave them all checked for now. Hit done. The default answer directory does not exist. Continue without verification. I'm going to type yes because I didn't oop, I didn't download the, the signature file. One of the things with the signature files that kind of suck is like if they hijack the server, potentially, then they could change the signature <laughs> file just as easily as they could change the freaking uh, the original download, right? I mean, there's probably schemes you could come up with of keep the eggs in different baskets to help avoid that kind of a thing. Or, you know, having like a publicly known key signature that's like just more transparent. But with it hidden in a signature file like that, I'm sure, not sure, but I would assume and imagine that the majority of people don't like check the signature against like the signature on the same website on archive.org or something. But if you're super serious about it, you might want to do something like that or write a script too. But then again, also, if that page had been hijacked in the past on archive.org, then they should, in theory, have the, the malicious signature on there as well, unless somehow that was reported and dealt with properly. Just killing time. Speaking of killing time, I'm going to pause it so it kills it all on your end. All right, it's done downloading those TGZ files, tar gzips. Usually if it's TGZ instead of a dot tar dot gz, then that implies that it's part of some package management system, right? So locations of sets, done, I guess. No, they're asking me. Oh, I just had to hit enter twice. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I hit control alt P to like pause the screen recorder when I was still in the VM. And then I was like, oops, wonder if that had any effect and then went to the regular host system. So maybe that control alt P, let me try it again. No, I actually don't. Uh, time appears wrong, set to that time. Actually, that's correct. Relinking to create unique kernel. I like that. It's got a very Linux vibe to it. So what it's like originally BSD was the ivory tower and Linux was the feed on the street. BSD still feels mostly ivory tower. But there's some benefit to that, right? Should be. All right, I'll pause it up again. Congratulations, your OpenBSD install has been successfully completed. When you log into your new system for the first time, please read your mail using the mail command. So this, I like this. Very human, once again, simple to the point. This is something that like, I wasn't getting out of the NetBSD install where it was sort of a mystery with a lot of stuff of what was going on. Um, 
And as you can tell, like these type of messages right here, congratulations, da 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 da, that's not written to an engineer, right? It's written to me if maybe I want to think of myself as an engineer or something, but it's not written to the engineers working on the system. It's most likely it's directed at the user that you could tell they have that end user in mind. So even if it's something so, you know, this to a lot of people, this probably looks like garbage from the 1970s or something. And to some extent, it really is. But uh, but that's the thing. That's that little, that's what matters, that little thought that counts. It just points things in the right direction. I've never felt like I wanted to put a hole in the wall next to me. When I was doing that BSD, I promise you, I felt like like damaging the wall. It was gross. That's my fault. I'm not blaming it on them. But uh, it's a relationship I do not want to get back involved with. Okay, so exit shell, halt, reboot, or reboot. Oh, make sure it's in focus, and I'm going to hit enter to reboot. At this point, I probably should have removed the disk, just like another one. I'm going to try and do it quick. Did I get it? Cool. So that should be the hard disk booting. And I'm going to hit the right control key and C. And that puts it in scale mode, and then I can maximize this. That, I don't know what the shortcut is on other virtual machines, but that's VirtualBox by default. I noticed when I watched one of my videos back when my shoulders go like this, it probably looks weird. It looked weird to me too, but I have a, like basically where I sit, a friend of ours gave us this thing. It's like these chairs. I don't know, maybe I can hold them up. Like this, they're like, kind of like bar stool chairs or whatever. Um, and then this desk is actually, it's like higher than a normal desk, but it's not quite like bar height. It's like literally like just below the buckle if I'm standing and I'm just below six foot. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. It works well for sitting and it also works well for standing without having to have that like adjustable pedestal thing going on. All right, I'm logging in as root. But yeah, so I, I put my arms on that counter on this table and it does that with my shoulders. And it just looks weird. It looks like I just raised my, my shoulders up on the video. So that's what's going on if you're wondering. Uh in that super secret password and uh open bsd did not bitch about my four digit password which i personally i like that so they assume that you you, you kind of know what you're doing too that you're not a complete idiot but yet they do show you the way as well so welcome to open bsd the proactively secure unix like operating system please use the send bug utility to report bugs beautiful beautiful Straight up, thanks for recommending OpenBSD. I like this. This is a system that I'm going to leave in the virtual machine and I'm going to toy with. And I may never become a BSD fan, and that's fine. But at least I have another Unix that doesn't drive me crazy to kick around that, you know, and plus cool people like it. So I like talking to cool people. And by cool, I don't mean like the people cool for school people. I mean like cool as in cool people, right? All right, so that's that. Um, so I should have X on here, right? So I should be able to do like a start X. Oh, nice. What? This doesn't look like TWM window. I mean, it does actually look like it. This is, uh, it's funny. This is an old kind of window manager, right? But it's not the oldest, worst one. And honestly, I like, I call it tab window manager. I know it's like Tom's or something, but that TWN one that comes with like by default with every version of X, at least this one probably has it too. I'm, I've become a fan of that. You know, I've gone back. It's just so simple and lightweight. I usually, otherwise I still am a window maker guy a lot too. Um, and otherwise LXDE probably, which I don't know for sure. LXDE, I would think in theory would run on here too. Little console. I like that. It's got like a windows three vibe kind of thing that's cute and of course you could probably install a window manager on here that's just sick that looks you know this is just the default thing so that's that and then to get out of this oh i just it's very much like twm you can just left click in the background to get that root menu 
laptop, calculator, all this stuff is most likely going to look pretty ugly. So don't be surprised <laughs> if it looks like super ugly. That's just the way a lot of this old stock stuff is. But it was more about the engineering than it was about like the, the polish on the user interface. And so if we want to get out of here, oops, the mouse seems a little bit like the acceleration curve is kind of weird on it right now, which is normal for a system like this in a virtual machine. Okay, I'll just go to exit. Are you sure you want to exit? Yeah. So that's how you get out of there. And then I'm going to hit right control C again to uh, get back to that normal kind of window. If you ever lose that window and you're in some mode, you know, and okay, let's say we're like here, control C, and it's like, oh, I need that, uh, you know, I need my menu back or I need these indicators down at the bottom back or something. If you just hit that same mode, like even though I'm in scaled mode right now, I'm going to go into scaled mode again, which will effectively take me out of it. And every time you go out of a mode by trying to re-enter it when you're already into it, it just kicks you back to this. It was a little bit counterintuitive for me back in the day, especially between uh, using it, like between having to deal with virtual machines. and it, I would just get stuck sometimes and forget the shortcuts and how it all worked. So I thought I'd pass it along. But that's that. And then when you want to go to shut it down, most of these newer systems, I mean, in most of the stuff in this century, you can just do an API shutdown where it will effectively, it's like tapping the power button and it will send that signal. Or you could probably as root type either, a lot of them have like a power off script. I'm going to try, let's see if it has a power off script. It doesn't look like it does. Okay, so in Linux, and I imagine most Unixes, shut down minus uh, H for halt. And then now, if I'm remembering, boom. Okay, so that works on Linux as well right there. And then the third choice, maybe the easiest for some people, is just to do the uh, the machine ACPI shutdown or hit right control and H. And that will send the signal. I don't know for sure if this BSD does or not, um, but I honestly, I'm, I'm guessing it does. And they scored so many points with me on that install, I don't even care if it doesn't. Thanks for watching.